worthy of all the praise and all the glory in this house this morning. We magnify you, Jesus, and give you praise. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements. Church directory, make sure you fill out your form. I don't know if we had fellowship yesterday or not. We canceled it. Well, there you go. Right? There you go. Well, so uh, clearly you're impressed by the power and influence that the pastor wields around this joint. Well, we caught everybody but you, so eh, it's all right. Um, and there's youth group on the 20th. All right. All right. Um, thank you for giving. Appreciate that. Amen. Um, we are going to John chapter 3 this morning. Um, and again, Happy New Year. Um, this is the first year that hindsight is actually 2020. And I'm glad it's in the rearview mirror, baby. Um, yeah. All right, quick, quick verse here. John chapter 3 and verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. So, uh, I want to talk this morning about this. More signal and less noise. More signal and less noise. So I want to welcome you to 2020, or as I like to call it, Jumanji, part two, level one. Yeah, who's ready to go? Come on now. We got through the first 12 levels. Uh, we do not get Dwayne Johnson. I'm sorry. Now, I've seen a wonderful meme that cracks me up. And nobody putting out there, oh, 2021 is going to be my year because y'all are cowards. Right? It's going to be my year. New, new year, new me. Uh -oh. Yeah, no. You get the <laughs> Same old me, guys. It ain't changing. Um, we are, uh, yeah, uh, going into, I <laughs> saw one meme that said, said, as we go into 2021, they said, keep your mouth shut, keep your hands to yourself, and don't touch anything. <laughs> I don't know what we did last year, but let's not have a repeat of that. Uh, I agree with that. Um, we are going to start this year, like we did last year, with a fast. And uh, I, I do hate to fast. Um, seriously, I, I hate any type of fasting. Uh, I hate uh, it all. Uh, but fasting is not done to get God's attention. Um, a fast is not a hunger strike, or in our case, a media strike. Um, a fast doesn't benefit God. A fast benefits me. Um, and fasting is what gives me clarity in my battle against the flesh. The thing we fight the most, we have three enemies. We have the devil, the world, and our flesh. Our flesh is by far the biggest problem. Um, so I'm not worried about the world. Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I'm not worried about the devil. The devil has been defeated. The flesh, on the other hand, needs to be slain, and that's the problem. Now, here's the issue. Oh, what are you waiting for my astrologer that said 2021, 2020 was going to be my year? That's a guy with a tire iron, by the way. Yeah, I'm going to tune him up a little bit. So the, the, the issue here is some of you all, that's the flesh you're fighting. Below is the flesh I'm fighting. Um, Interesting story. The, the one above, that's those geckos in Florida, right? You've been to Florida and there's 10,000 of those little gecko lizards, right? You see them everywhere. If you go to Colombia, those are those and they're everywhere. They're three foot long iguanas and they're in the trees and they're literally everywhere. And I can see Darcy going, well, I guess I'm never going to Colombia then. So um, it really freaks you out at first and then you just kind of get used to it. You're like, huh. That is a big lizard. Um, 
uh, the advice we gave is you leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. And I took that advice to heart because that's a big lizard. And so I left him alone. Um, the, the, the title of this message is More Signal and Less Noise. And it's an old radio term that has a new meaning in this age. Uh, Y'all remember radios that looked like that? When I was a kid, uh, my mom and dad bought me an AM FM radio. It had a little switch on it, right, from AM to FM, and you dial it in, right, and it got the stations that were within 17 feet of the radio, and that was about it. Yeah. And other than that, it was like, um, and you know, so we could get two stations. We could get the Mount Vernon AM station and the Mount Vernon FM station, and that was it. Um, we could literally get nothing on those things. But you'd spin the dial and you'd hear like a voice from the ether and then you'd hear a lot of static. And mostly you'd just hear static. Because um, we're getting a lot of signal. Now, here was the cool part. You all ever do this? At night, you turn on the AM side. Man, I would get stations in Detroit. I'd listen to stations in St. Louis. Because after some of that other stuff cleared out, again, this is Back in the day, that AM signal, 50,000 watt AM signal, will travel a long way. And so I remember listening to um, St. Louis and uh, WJW in, New in um, Detroit and going, wow, you know, that was cool, all right? We didn't have cable when I grew up. That was cool. So that was, that was it. But you would tune them and you would get signal at night because everything else had kind of cleared out. Back in the day, Lord, I'm turning my dad more and more by the minute. You remember when, yeah, you remember when radio licenses, they were good for certain hours of the day and then a station would go off. How many of y'all watched the Star Spangled Banner when a TV station go off the air for the day, right? Bunch of liars. You all watch that. If you're older than 30, you watch that because their license would let them broadcast between this hour and that hour. And then they'd have to go off the air. Dun, 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 dun. WOSU, the public broadcasting station, Channel 34, would play Carmen, Ohio, the chimes, the marching band, right? They'd, they'd play it at midnight, and then you could pick it up at 6 o'clock the next morning. You guys are like, you are a loser, dude. <laughs> Ah, so when those other stations would go off the air, you could hear these stations that had, were 50,000 watt, had a 24-hour broadcast in them, and you could hear stuff from all over the country. You'd hear stuff on a clear night, you could hear stuff from Georgia, right? The old WTBS that would broadcast like Braves games, you could hear in the summer when it was clear. You guys, we can get on with the rest of the message. It was cool, and it was my childhood, and last year was horrible. Just let me enjoy this, okay? You know, just let me take it in. So, now, when we talk today about more signal and less noise, um, you, we are bombarded with um, information overload, right? All those are websites, right? How many of you have ever said, I said this as recently as yesterday, I got 200 channels and nothing's on, right? I'm wearing out that remote because that's what men do, right? Right? 80 billion channels. In the dark, I look at it. Yeah, I'm not even looking at it and there's nothing on. I can tell. I'm a man. That's what I do. I can tell and there's nothing on. Right? Nothing on. We have satellite radios in our cars. Spin the dial. I got nothing on. It's all junk. No, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad the Christmas music's gone, if I'm being very honest with you, because I kind of had it to hear with Christmas music. I'm just like, we will see you next December. Thank you. Um, but we do that now, because we have so much information, none of it resonates. Right? Oodles of information pounding down that our brain is just always turned on. And, we're all, and so we, it's hard for us to get quiet because we have so 
much noise. One of the things that I've done um, was this I put in my office uh, at night. Because if it's on my nightstand, the minute I wake up. Anybody do that? The minute they wake up, they look at the phone, look at the phone. Check my messages, check, check my Facebook, check my Instagram, check, 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 check. Yeah, that too. I, how many of you ever played this game? If I go to sleep right now, I can get X amount of sleep before I have to wake up. How many knows you're not going to sleep right now, right? If I go to sleep right now, that's not going to happen, but hey, go crazy. How many of you, Mark and I were talking about this last week, you go, you go on this, and you go on your Facebook, and like, oh, cool, that looks like fun. Oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Oh, they're, they're communists. My God, this country's falling apart. <laughs> right? Five minutes in, and you need your blood pressure medicine dialed up to 11. Right? These are your friends, and you all have stupid friends. Because you've said it. Right? Some of you have stupid family. <laughs> I have family that goes to church here, so I don't. <laughs> I have other family that watch, also not stupid. <laughs> right? But you flip through that, and <laughs> Facebook back in the day was great. Facebook's been weaponized, right? Oh, I hate Facebook. Do I go on to it a lot? Sure I do. <laughs> do I hate it? I absolutely hate it. But we go on there, you know, puppies and kids for five minutes, and then the politics start. And it's like, oh, I hate everyone. We do that to ourselves. There's a point to all this, I promise. In the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah, it talks about Israel had just come back together around the walls of Jerusalem, and Ezra begins to speak the word of the Lord to them. Uh, I will say this. It's always a good place to start is in the word of the Lord. That's the best place to start. Um, I, 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 I said it last year, I said it this year. Find a Bible reading plan and stick to it. Um, I, I, a lot of us are friends on uh, the Bible app or not, um, let's do that, um, because it's great to read the Bible with people. Um, it, encour it encourages you, and it keeps you accountable, right? Because I can see in my stream who read what. You know, I read this thing, you know, you read X day of, uh, you know, of the, your Bible plan. Um, but the Bible reading plan is, is so important because, and, and I've told the church before, Starting your day in the Word is the best thing you can do. Because uh, one thing I was thinking about this morning is, you know, uh, I had a week off and I worked for three days and then I had a week and a half off. And tomorrow we go back into it with both feet. And I'm going to be busy, busy, busy. I, I mean, I'm just looking at my calendar going, holy smokes. Um, and so, not you. <laughs> so I got I to gotta, I gotta start my day in the Word. Because I've got to be intentional about making that time for Jesus in the morning. And so in Ezra, we're talking, we read, and when they hear the word, they get convicted. And they start confessing the things that are keeping them from being right with God. And the one sin they mentioned was that they had wedded themselves to the locals, to the local pagans. And the lesson we learned from that is don't become wedded to the world. Don't become married to the world. Here's what the priest says in Ezra chapter 10. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Therefore, uh, make confession to the Lord, the God of your father, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from all the pagan wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, yes, as you have said, so we must do. What Ezra is saying there is you can't stay married to the world and be right with God. 
It just doesn't work. He says you can't stay wedded to that thing that's not of God and still be right because it doesn't work. Mark chapter 10 says this. Jesus says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. One flesh. You can't be half world and half Christ. It just doesn't work. You're either all in or you're all out. And so you have to separate yourself. And, and so we find ourselves in a position where we want to grow closer to God, but boy, there are some things in the world we really like. Let's be honest. And there are some things that I'm going to have to get rid of if I'm going to get closer to God. Luke chapter 16 says, No servant can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and, and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is specifically defined as material greed and wealth. So it does stand for money, but it, it's kind of a general term for all the things in the world. No, I'm not preaching about money this morning. Everybody relax. Deep exhale. Not a sermon about money. It's not possible to fully engage with God if you are fully engaged in the world. This is why we take times at the beginning of the year and we separate ourselves so that we can hear God. Separating physically is easily easy. The biggest challenge we have is separating our minds. I find, and Charity and I have talked about this, for me, because of the nature of my job, plus pastoring this church, plus everything, I find it very hard for my mind to get quiet. Um, and God has a hard time speaking to a busy mind. Um, here, I'll, so here's, here's a problem you experience later in life, right? You get up and go to the bathroom, so that's obviously in the middle of the night. Now, Anyone else want to do this? I hope I can go back to sleep. I literally caught myself doing this. Don't think of anything between your room and the bathroom and the way back, and I just want to lay down and not think of anything. The laughter goes, some of you are doing this. Because if the thought comes in my mind, I don't know why, but it feels like it needs to turn all the lights on while it's there. Right? All right, I'm just going to the bathroom. I do my thing. I'm going to go back to bed. How many licks does it take to get to the, the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? I don't know. Well, 3.30 in the morning seems like a great time to think about it. Does it? And then you lay in bed. Now, because I'm blind as a bat, right? So now everybody's disappeared. Now you're all back. Um, I have a clock that has red numbers on it that can be seen from Cincinnati. <laughs> Charity goes, planes are going to start landing in our bedroom from the big red letters on my, right? That thing taunts me. Oh, I got to go to sleep. How many legs does it take? How, what time is it? I don't have my glasses on, but I can tell what time it is. And you can't turn your brain off. Anyone else deal with that? Yeah, I just never used to have that problem. My kids don't have that problem. My son will go to bed at 8 o'clock at night and sleep till 8 o'clock the next morning and not get up. What's up with that? To the point that I sent an 86-pound dog in to wake him up. Do I do it to be mean? Sure I do. Why not? But we need to quiet our brains sometimes because our brains don't turn off. Right? Election season. That was the worst. Still is. 
right? How many of you, and I don't care which side you're on, get up, go to the bathroom, now you're thinking about the election. Now your brain won't shut off. What if? Uh, it's horrible, but it happens because we can't find. Remember we talked about over Christmas that Jesus was the Prince of Peace? And sometimes we forget that because our brains are so busy with other stuff. There are times where we need to get away and quiet our, our minds. Jesus did this. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Now in the morning have been risen long before daylight which in this time of year can, can be like 8.30 because it's never light. He went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Why did Jesus depart to a solitary place? Because even he was affected by the hustle of everyday life. And this is why you have to be intentional about your walk with Christ. Because nobody's going to accidentally go to heaven. You're not going to die and go, wow, I did not see this coming. You, you have to be intentional. I intentionally do my prayer and Bible reading and devotion first thing in the morning. I intentionally do that. Because I, it is important enough to me, to, I have to carve out time for that. It's, you have to be intentional. And Jesus separated himself first thing in the morning to pray. He said, I've got to get away from the hustle and bustle and pray. Now, the other way we separate ourselves is by fasting. You know I'm going to get to this. Because fasting prepares us for spiritual warfare. Matthew chapter 4, and verse 1 says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Thanks, Captain Obvious. If you don't eat for 40 days and 40 nights, you're going to be hungry. If you eat Chinese food, in 40 minutes you're going to be hungry. That's not the point. But the point is, if you fast, you're going to be hungry. Not necessarily physical, I want to jam some food in my mouth. But if you turn off some of that noise... I wonder if I just looked and Facebook and accidentally opened. Oh, oh, I don't know what to do. It accidentally opened. All right. I wonder what's going on. You're going to be hungry for that stuff that you look at. Anybody have the screen time thing on their iPhones where it tells you how much time you spent on things? And if you call that a liar? You spent 14 hours on social media this week. You shut up. Right? There you go. Now you're on the road to redemption right now. Hallelujah. When Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now the tempter came to him. And he said, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. I had to read that a couple times. The Spirit led him to the wilderness so that he would be tempted. Jesus needed to be proved before he could be used. The Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, leads him into the wilderness. The Spirit will lead you and help you prepare yourself for what you're going to need to deal with. You can't be effective spiritually unless you're prepared, right? You're not going to accidentally be a spiritual heavyweight. The devil confronts Jesus and he's repelled. If you read Matthew chapter 4, it is written, it is written, it is written. The devil comes back with, it is also written, and Jesus comes back with, but it's also written. You've got to know the word. And after the test, Matthew 4 and verse 11, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And it's a pattern that repeats itself. Luke chapter 22, verse 41. 
And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. Here we see again, Jesus withdraws again to pray, and the angel comes not before, but after. We want the angels <coughs> to come help us, but we just as soon take a pass on the testing. You can't have a testimony without a test. And you can't have power without preparation. Here's the story we read in Matthew chapter 17. It says, when they had come to the multitude, the man came to him kneeling down to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers severely, for he often falls in the fire and often into the water. So that I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. This story from Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17 is fairly late in Jesus' ministry. So the disciples had been out doing their thing uh, for some time at this point. Jesus had sent them out two by two. He sent 70 out two by two and said, you know, you go heal the sick and do all this stuff and great stuff. And they're out doing their thing. So they had been doing this. They were not, but they couldn't do it in this case in Matthew chapter 17. Even mature Christians have stubborn problems. I'll show you something. You'll love this. This is my fellowship card with the United Pentecostal Church. This says that I'm a minister in the United... I was sure when I got this, it was all good, right? This is my get out of jail free card. I got it. No more problems for me. I'm an idiot. Thank you. Mature Christians just have bigger problems, more stubborn problems, problems that won't go away. Mature, anybody seen that Dave Chappelle mean, mean modern problems require a modern solution? Mature Christians have mature Christian problems. These are not problems that are easily dispensed with, but they tend to stick around. And sometimes, can you stand it? What we do, when we do what we've always done, it just doesn't work. Well, I know if, if I, you know, sing this song and you know, read this passage, I'll be strengthened and we'll move on from this. And it doesn't work. And you get down to pray and nothing. Prayers go, hit the ceiling, come back, land in your lap. Jesus tells them, he says, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. A couple things to note of that. One, Jesus didn't leave the disciples or the father or the boy hanging. Just because you don't seem to get an answer to what you're praying for doesn't mean Jesus isn't able to address it. It means he may be choosing to not address it right now. Or there may be other things that need to be taken care of first before it gets addressed. And the verse continues. It says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, uh, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. It's all about faith, right? Nope. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. We have said in error, if you just have enough faith, God will do it. Jesus seems to contradict that very sentiment. 
by saying, there's a kind and a type that isn't going anywhere except by prayer and fasting. There's a kind you can have enough faith, and God will, and faith is great. We're going to talk about that. But sometimes spiritual discipline is what's required, and prayer and fasting and killing our flesh and hearing from God. You have got to have faith, right? Hebrews chapter 11. We hit on this a little bit last week. Now, faith is the faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? So you've got to have faith because you can't please God without faith, but sometimes you need an add-on to your faith, right? James chapter 2 talks about a mixture of faith and works, right? Faith without works is dead. Some things require more than just faith because the above situation was not about just healing somebody from a sickness, the above situation was about spiritual warfare. And that's a whole different kettle of fish than somebody is sick, we're going to pray for them, plead the blood over them, and they'll be healed, right? That's certainly wonderful and, and biblical and the work of God. But some things, now tread lightly here, some things are not due to illness. Some things are spiritually based. We've made the mistake of the past going, everything is spiritually based. Well, you're just depressed, right? People who have had depression and anxiety and things like that, oh, it's spiritual. No, a lot of that's chemical, actually. And you should take medicine for that. I have chemical imbalance in my body because I have type 2 diabetes. You know what I do? I take a medicine for it. So a lot of that is right? Medical. But there are other times where it is spiritual, where there is a spirit that won't, and let me encourage you, the Holy Spirit will lead you. There's a gift of discerning of spirits and going, you know what? That is not me just not feeling right because I don't feel good. That is, there's a spiritual, you ever do that? You ever go somewhere and the Holy Spirit will check you and go, hmm, you should probably not be here. Or, I'll go even further, or a person. I remember when Charity and I went to France the first time, we were walking around this area of, of, uh, of Paris, and it, it got sketchy in a hurry. And both of us, the Holy Spirit quickened us. The issues here are not just physical. They are spiritual in nature, and you would do well to leave. And we turned right around. You'll feel it in your spirit. Where you go, mm, this is not good. This does not agree with the Holy Ghost. And I need to remove myself from the situation. That's, that is spiritual. That is every bit of spiritual is going, I don't feel good. I need to go to the doctor. Right? Which is also perfectly fine. Some things require more than faith because they're warfare. They require prayer and fasting. Some things are spiritual warfare. You are going to deal with spiritual warfare if you want to serve God. And it will get more intense as you get, consecrate yourself to God. Anybody ever say, I'm going to consecrate myself to God. I'm going to really take my walk with God seriously. I'm going to make time to, prayer and fast, to pray and fast. The question is, how quickly will things start to happen? where you go, oh, where is God? Have you ever had that happen? You go, I'm for this time, this time I'm going to, oh. why? Because the devil has no interest in you getting close to God. None at all. Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his life. Let me let, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. And if you've ever tried to do something for God, you know this. And if you look at the armor of God, and we're not going to go through all of this, but it's the... 
you know, the, the girdle of truth, the shoes of the, with the preparation of the gospel, peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. The only offensive weapon in the bunch is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's verse 17. Yeah, we're going to put that up. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, capital S. This is an interesting thing here. We're going to break this down a little bit. Sword of the Spirit, capital S, which is the word, small w, of God. Words and the way they are spelled mean things in Scripture. The sword of the Spirit, capital S, is the Spirit of God which is the word of God, small w, which denotes the written word of God, different than John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word, that word there is a capital W, that's the Word. The Word became flesh. That's Jesus. Right? Go back to that last verse, Gabri. Helmet of Salvation and the Sword of the Spirit, capital S, which is the Word of God. How are you going to hear the Word of God if you don't read it? How are you going to fight the devil if you're not in to his word. When we read the word, we get a word from the word. That's catchy. I may make a bumper sticker out of that. When we read the word, we get a word from the word. You can't hear from God if you don't talk to him. The word, the word is what's going to give you victory over the devil. It is written. It is written. We have to be grounded in the word if we're ever going to have spiritual victory. Amen? Amen. All right, almost done. John chapter 3 says this, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you uh, beyond Jordan to whom... Uh, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John's disciples came to John, this is John the Baptist, came to him and they had a concern. John baptized Jesus, and we read John chapter 1. John baptizes Jesus. Jesus begins his ministry in John chapter 2, the marriage supper of Cana of Galilee, right? We have no wine, you know, it turns water into wine. Jesus immediately goes from turning water into the wine to tearing up the temple. It's John chapter 2. Now we're in John chapter 3, and Jesus and his disciples are baptizing people. And John's disciples have a problem with this. Here's what they say. The guy you baptized, he's baptizing himself, and everybody's going to him. Now, we're going to read this out of the New Living Translation, which is my personal devotional translation, because it really highlights the pettiness of John the Baptist's disciples. And who among us doesn't love a good cat fight? I know I do. Here's the New Living Translation. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, I mean, they say he's the Messiah, is also baptizing people. Read that last part. And everyone's going to him instead of us. <laughs> Boo -hoo -hoo. I, John undoubtedly wanted to throat punch them at this point. This is why I love the New Living. In the same verse wherein they identified Jesus as the Messiah, they cannot put their egos in check. John, people are paying attention to the Messiah and not me, and that's a problem. Well, you guys are idiots. 
But that's what he, they're saying. Why? Because your flesh is your biggest problem. And even being a stone's throw from the Messiah, they said, my ego is hurt because people are paying attention to Jesus and not me. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it him from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I'm not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. Because he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. And in our last verse, I'll go back to our text. That's the New King James Version of that last bit. He must increase! But I've got to decrease. Boys, you're letting your ego get in the way of what God's doing. Your flesh is hindering you from seeing the kingdom of God. Because flesh always does that. Jesus is there. Jesus is baptizing. It's hurting my ego. People don't care about me as much because they care about Jesus. Yeah, that's how that's supposed to work. John understood that it wasn't all about him. It was all about Jesus. And if Jesus was going to be made greater, John needed to be made less. And you know what? That was fine with John. I want that to be fine with me. Here's what I want us to do. Starting tomorrow and for the next three weeks, turn off your social media. Turn it off. Take the apps off your phone. Lose the bookmarks on your computer. And some of you are going, why doesn't God just slay me right now? It'll be okay. I promise. There's a second part to this. Turn off the news. There's a third part to this. My God, he's like a used car salesman. All that time you spent on this, spend right here. If we're going to have God do something great, think of the lengths that God went to in 2020 to get our attention. I don't want all that to be wasted. I don't want us to go, well got herd immunity. I guess we can go back to the way we were. God forbid. God forbid. I want to turn off some of that noise and get in the book and get a word and prepare myself for what God's going to do. Amen? We need a word from God. And so for three short weeks... Now, I will make you a guarantee... I don't do this often, but I'll throw this out here. You take three weeks off of your social media, and I'm going to call out Facebook in particular because it's especially noxic. Or if you do Twitter, Twitter is particularly horrible. Turn that off for three weeks. When we come together again in three weeks, you will feel like a million bucks. You will have clarity of mind. You will have heard from the Lord. Dear... I don't make many guarantees. You turn off that stuff for three weeks, you will hear from God. You go, I'm going to take the time I spent jacking my blood pressure through the roof because my friends and family are the stupidest people on the face of the earth. That's what you think. I'm going to put that away. Why not? And I'm going to pray for those stupid people. Right? Instead of going through 
picking fights on social media. You're an idiot. You're a bigger idiot. You're an idiot plus one. You're an idiot plus infinity. Checkmate. Right? Put it all away. Get a Bible reading plan. Here's the other thing. Bible reading plans don't have to be, I'm going to read the entire Bible through. I mean, that, th those are good and those are great, but find one that takes you five minutes a day. And then go, I'm going to pray for these people that I'm not seeing on social media. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to wait for it, call them, and tell them I'm praying for them. What? You madman, these actually work as phones? They do. It's crazy, isn't it? Kathy didn't know what to do with me. God bless her. And I'm telling you, in three weeks, we will have a Holy Ghost time when we come in here because we will be in tune with God. Do you believe it? Amen. I believe it too. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you this morning. God, I thank you for your word and for your spirit today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, move right now in the Holy Ghost. I pray in the name of Jesus, let your spirit touch each and every one here. Lord, as we move closer to you in the new year, God, I pray in Jesus' name, help us to consecrate ourselves, Lord, to take the noise out of our hearts and out of our minds, Lord God, and fix our minds and hearts on you, Lord, to engage in spiritual battle, Lord, with those things that we haven't been able to shake off. Lord, I pray right now that you would strengthen each person that's here, Lord, each person that's watching over the internet. God, I pray that you would strengthen them, oh God, and allow them to be moved by the Holy Ghost. We thank you for everything you've done and everything you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Starting tomorrow, turn it off and see what God won't do. I love every one of you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. We'll see you next week.